Thanks, everyone. Um, so I was one of the co-founders of Sparkline Data, which got acquired by Oracle a couple of months back. Uh, Oracle's really serious about Spark and Spark-based services and on the cloud. And this is part of the, um, part of the um, strategy. Um, we also acquired a company called datascience.com, which does data science, and that's, uh, that was also recently announced. And there's a portfolio of services that are evolving on top of Spark, on top on the Oracle Big Data Cloud that you would be seeing over the next few months. So today we are going to talk about um, how, to, how do we use Spark to do interactive queries, sub-second queries, uh, slice and dice and analytics. If you want to plug in, say, a Tableau or Oracle uh, BI tool or any kind of dashboards into a data lake using Spark. So what were the key drivers? So when we started Sparkline um, four years back, one of the uh, key design, um, I was the head of analytics at Disney prior to that, and my co-founder was uh, one of the key contributors for Apache Hive. And we realized that uh, for business analysts, data scientists to query data, large amounts of data in a data lake, iteratively, slice and dice kind of analysis were very slow. And those of you who've used Hive, um, any kind of, um, you know, direct dashboards on top of a data lake or HDFS would, can attest to uh, how slow it's been. Um, so our goal was to set out to make this completely interactive. So we started out four years back, and we were fortunate to work with Netflix early on, and we open sourced this, uh, this product called Spark Druid, and that's, that was the beginnings of this interactive query service. And that evolved into a commercial product called Snap, which is now part of Oracle Big Data Cloud. But the key drivers were, you know, customers were consolidating data in data lakes, uh, whether it's HDFS, object storage like S3, and um, doing extracts and pre-aggregating data is extremely error-prone and expensive. So uh, if you have a very detailed IoT data set or ad tech data set, you want to query it at the granularity of the data that it, that it arrives in. So it could be every minute, every hour, uh, but you don't want to pre-aggregate it because that involves ETL, summarizing, and so on. So how can you query data at its most granular level and still get sub-second response times? So that was our design criteria. Um, and finally, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, at Disney, one of the things that we had was a combination of uh, data scientists and BI all together because there was a lot of use cases where one turns into another, and uh, essentially the key criteria was I need access to the most detailed level of data. I don't want summarized data, right? So, uh, so the goal for us was to be able to do very fast interactive queries, but not only that, uh, we wanted it to be elastic. So we worked with customers early on where, for example, they would have a financial close, the data was in HDFS, and they would, have, uh, you know, they would have a need for a lot of concurrency towards the end of a quarter, but then what happens at the beginning of the quarter? The load goes down, and you have a lot of these uh, cores sitting idle. So it's elastic, and it should be easy to deploy, right? Um, those of us who have used Hadoop clusters know how complicated it is to set up and deploy compared to just a Spark standalone cluster. So we chose Spark as a platform, not only as a runtime platform. We are, we are built on top of the catalyst layer in Spark. And essentially, we make it as simple as possible to deploy this interactive query service with only a Spark standalone cluster. Right? Of course, it can run on Spark on Yarn and other uh, resource managers, but primarily uh, we have customers using it standalone with multi-billion rows, sub-seconds, queries, 24 by 7. So that gets us to the second thing, is right? We are 10 to 100x faster than traditional Hadoop, BI, or even databases, right? And uh, the interactive analysis, um, essentially the whole interactivity is exposed through a JDBC, ODBC layer, so you can plug in your existing BI tools, uh, like Tableau, into our layer. And the third part of it is we focused on business semantics. Um, so typically in the enterprise data warehousing business intelligence uh, world, um, there's this concept of cubes. And um, the, oh, in, the, in the legacy world, cubes are pre-aggregated, and that's, that's a problem. So in our world, the cubes are not pre-aggregated. They are the most detailed level. And we'll talk about what the architecture of it behind the scenes. So this sort of a busy diagram, but it, um, you know, I'm going to go from that side to this side. So the idea is you, know, you have data landing in data lakes from a variety of data sources. It could be your CRM system, your financial ERP system, 
It could be um, social data, IoT data. You could be moving data from legacy data warehouses to data marks. But then once you move this data into a data lake or HDFS, you want to consume that data. Now that's on the extreme right here. So your consumption of data is both by business analysts and data scientists and uh, developers and end users. And they're using a variety of tools. They're using BI tools. They're using Jupyter Notebooks, Zeppelin Notebooks. They may be writing Python code, R code. Now, how can you have a single consumption layer so that any query that is submitted into this infrastructure comes back in seconds, as opposed to waiting there for the hour clock to spin, right? So that middle layer where you see model and manage is what we built, and that's built on top of uh, Spark, uh, uh, Spark runtime, right? So when you deploy Snap, you're basically deploying Snap with Spark. And the, the key part of our, um, uh, of our platform is this thing called the cube infrastructure. And I'll walk through, walk through an example of what it takes to define a cube. So essentially, you have source data that's coming in from all these data sources into a data lake. And in a typical enterprise data warehouse, you have this concept of a star schema, which is a fact table and a set of dimension tables. So what we do is we take that and we uh, allow you to build a cube. And a cube is nothing but um, you know, a pre-joined set of um, uh, denormalized, uh, pre-joined denormalized tables with indexes on top of it. Just as Google indexes data and Splunk indexes data, we index business data. And if, uh, if you're familiar with the BI notions of dimensions, essentially we take the dimensions in a star schema and we build inverted indexes on top of it. And then these indexes are, per, are persisted in a deep storage, but at query time, they are brought in and memory mapped. And that's how we achieve the performance that the, the interactivity and the subsequent queries uh, that you can see with Snap. So that's, and, and then once, once you define the cube, what happens at runtime? So we expose everything through Spark SQL. So if your tool can connect to Spark Thrift Server, and, and can talk Spark SQL. In fact, it doesn't have to be Spark SQL. You could write Scala code against the uh, data sets and data frames directly. Everything gets accelerated. So it's, it's at least 10 times faster than just using any other in-memory technology, even Spark's in-memory technology. Uh, we, have, we have seen customers who move away from Presto to us. Um, so there's a variety of use cases, but primarily it's about interactive queries, right? So that's the overall architecture. I'm going to talk a little bit about what it takes to build the cube, but, but essentially the, the, what Snap brings to the table is uh, it's Spark native. Uh, what, when we say Spark native, what we mean is it doesn't just connect to Spark, right? We are built on Spark. So we took Apache Spark, uh, we added a whole bunch of BI-specific optimizations on top of the, uh, the Catalyst layer in, in Spark. So we, it does, you know, there are four important things as part of Snap. One, it's fast and in-memory. So it's in-memory indexes. Uh, they are memory mapped at runtime, and so that provides you uh, a really fast interactive query response time. And second, it's designed for BI use cases. So if you've used an enterprise data warehouse, joins are typically the choking point, right? Um, and it takes a long time if you write a query on a join which has 20 tables, for example, which is very common if you have, a, if you have an enterprise data warehouse. What we do is behind, we allow you to write joins, but behind the scenes we eliminate joins and we rewrite it to use our in-memory index. So that's one of our key um, um, optimization techniques that we use. Now, there are further uh, advanced techniques in, uh, in a BI environment because not, you don't want to put everything in an index or you don't want to flatten and denormalize all the data. You may have data that are living in tables which you have to join at runtime. We have further optimizations where even if you join our cube to other sets of tables, we allow you to reduce the number of rows that comes out of a fact table, and so the query response time is still going to be in subseconds. So those are some of the things that we have patent pending on uh, some of these uh, join techniques. Uh, the third aspect is BI semantic modeling, and this is where we, we walk through a process of defining a cube. We allow you to specify dimensions, metrics, dependency between columns, we allow you to bin metrics. So if, you, if you're a Tableau user, you would know this concept of binning. Um, essentially, these are techniques that we allow you to use to, uh, to semantically define your data, and we use that uh, definitions to further optimize uh, the queries. And finally, these cubes are related to a business domain. So we have customers, for example, who do anomaly detection on uh, travel and expense reports, or they would be doing general ledger analysis. 
Uh, we have a customer in the ad tech industry who does campaign attribution analysis. So these are business domains, and essentially you can build these cubes for a domain and provide access to a set of users in that domain, right? So think of these as pre-canned uh, uh, pre data, data sets that when uh, exposed through Spark SQL, uh, people can build a cockpit or a dashboard on top of it or Tableau on top of it and have thousands of concurrent users and still the response time is in seconds. So what is this cube really, right? Um, so we, uh, there, there's a three-step process typically our customers go through in using Snap. The first step is you define a join graph. So in an enterprise data warehouse environment, your join graph is the relationship between a fact table and a set of dimension tables. Um, and then once you've defined the join graph, you take the columns in all these tables and you categorize them as dimensions and metrics. And the third step is you partition the cube to say, um, do I need to partition it by day or month, depending on how frequently you get new data uh, as part of your uh, business life cycle. So here's an example of, uh, uh, this, is, this is again an Oracle specific schema that one of our customers used. So this is uh, a travel, a, a fact table that represents travel and expenses, which is joined to a whole set of dimension tables, right? Now, if people are writing queries against this table, joining all these tables, which are sitting in HDFS, you can imagine you know, the speed and the response times. Now, what we do is we take this and we flatten it out and build a cube on top of it. And uh, as I mentioned before, the cube has got inverted indexes in the dimensions and, and so on, right? So once you build this cube, it's persisted back in HDFS. But at query time, you, uh, you basically query it as if you were querying the tables and joining them. Now, a, a query like this, which joins the fact table travel standard account expense to HR people, would get rewritten to use our index. And our, the first time you run this query, this qu the, the index will be downloaded. The index is made up of many files. They're downloaded to a distributed Spark cluster and memory map. So every query that is issued from the BI environment or your Jupyter notebooks, which involve any of these joins, are not going to, uh, it's not going to be joined when it comes into Spark at runtime, it's going to be rewritten to use our file format, our index, and the results comes back in seconds, right? So that's sort of a 30,000 foot uh, view of how this all comes together. Now, there's a lot of detail behind it, and there's a demo, and if you have time, you should check out our booth uh, where we have a demo with Tableau as well. So this was a quick lightning session, but uh, happy to take any questions. But the takeaway is basically, um, essentially we are, uh, we are specific to a business domain and uh, in the enterprise data warehouse uh, BI environments. Uh, we are very fast. And so far, in fact, we have, we've had customers where, who have found us faster than Athena. Um, we, have, uh, you know, we have customers who have replaced, us, replaced Presto with us, uh, and of course any kind of uh, standard SQL on Hadoop. Uh, and environments as well. Um, obviously, we eliminate, uh, one of the key things is we, we, don't pre we don't require you to pre-aggregate data, which is a huge win when you're doing enterprise BI, because pre-aggregation involves, um, you know, your loss of detail, it involves ETL, it involves extra uh, resources, and so on. So these cubes are actually built at the lowest grain of your fact tables. So it's high ROI. And finally, it's a very simple deployment. All we require is a Spark cluster. So essentially, you're deploying Snap on a Spark cluster. It can run on standalone. One of our customers in the ad tech space uh, runs billions and billions of rows, terabytes of data on just a five-node Spark cluster in a standalone mode, right? And it's 24 by seven. They have a dashboard the, which is exposed to users worldwide, and it's campaign and advertising analysis, right? And they're constantly uh, querying data from Spark line. Um, so it's very simple, easy to deploy, and, um, and, and, and hence all of these coming together is basically giving a new BI uh, backend model to customers who are looking to deploy an enterprise warehouse at scale. Any questions? Yeah, so I had a question about uh, concurrency. How do you guys handle concurrency in this case? Yeah, it's a good question. So for us, you know, when, we, when you define concurrencies, what is the number of sessions 
per second, right? That's how we measure, because our response time is in second. So we have, uh, we've done benchmarks where we have done almost 50 sessions a second with just one thrift server. And we can use Zookeeper to have multiple thrift servers and load balancer and so on. Uh, and in our case, uh, that 50 session concurrency tra can translate to 5,000 to 50,000 users, right? Um, so that, that's the answer to uh, your concurrency question. All up, uh, sorry. Um, so you say uh, the data is still going to be in HDFS, but then you're building an index on top of that, right? Right. Um, but if that index is already built, I'm, trying to, I'm still trying to uh, uh, pretty much understand, like, it's, you're, still still running, uh, you're still running Spark at the back end. Yes. Right? Yeah. So uh, maybe it's not a question over here, but I'm still <laughs> trying to understand how, is it fa how, how do you make it faster? Because at the end of the day, it's still a, um, a Spark job. Uh, Yeah, but uh, the thing is, like, say, the very first time I run a query, right? If I know this query, you're indexing everything there. But a uh, BI user can pretty much yeah, so do that's anything, the, any queries. Yeah so, that's the, yeah, so that's the IP that we have, right? So it's not just Spark. So we use Spark as a runtime, but essentially any query that you submit to Spark, so if, you, if I have to dig into more technical detail, right? Um, so any, ta any job that comes into Spark line, which is basically a Spark cluster, has multiple stages, and each stage has multiple tasks, right? So in our parlance, an index is made up of multiple files or segments, and each task operates on a segment. And you can think of each segment as containing the data and the index, a subset of the data and the index. So in a sense, we are, we are distributing the query, and we are not only distributing the query across multiple tasks, we, are, we have indexes so that if you have a where clause or a filter, we don't need to do a scan of the entire file, right? And it's in memory. So all of these put together is what makes it fast. Now on top of that, we, you know, we don't use the Spark optimization. We have our own optimization. So if you have a join, which joins two tables, we know, based on the filter, not to scan the entire table. So we can reduce the number of rows that comes out. So all of these put together is what makes it fast. So if the index gets skewed, you understand what you, you're creating the indexes to eliminate their massive join on, on the back end. And, right. But the, if the indexes get skewed because your portfolio may shift, you may have more accounts coming next time, so your indexing gets skewed. So your performance is going to be degraded immediately. How you modify the cube to ensure that your index does not get skewed because you cannot predict how many accounts are going to pull at the time of the actual select query. Yeah, so it's not a B tree index. So when we say an index, what we do is, so when you define a cube, you define dimensions on any column that you would want to filter or group by on. But, how, right? that, but based on s assumptions at the beginning, when you run the query, you're creating it's the It's not dimension. dependent on the query. It's dependent on the data. But, right? but the data changes. That's what I'm saying. I, when sure. I say query, based on my current portfolio, I have a 10 million accounts today. Right. Tomorrow I bought the bank. I have 150 million accounts. Yeah. So my dimensions completely shifted. All my stuff is get skewed because now I'm operating on a different scale. Yeah. So do I need to update that cube? Yes, the cube well, is constantly... dynamically updates based on the volume of data coming in. The cube is constantly updated, right? It's, as new data comes in for facts or as your dimension changes, you're constantly updating the cube. Who's doing this? Is my data analyst needs it's to part of your, it's, it's part of your ETL. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's not... There is no automation at behind the scene. You actually right now there isn't. So that's... I mean, obviously we were a small startup. So now that we are part of Oracle, uh, Oracle's big on this autonomous concept, right? So there will be, so we have, for example, we could automatically profile the data, understand the yeah, skew, yes, and based on that, that's yes. So we're working on all of that, exactly. Gotcha, thank you. Hi, just a quick question. So during the query time, how many executors do you use? Yeah, so, so typically when you capacity plan this, you would say, so let's say we, uh, I'll take an actual customer use case, right? So the customer has 10 terabytes of data. When you index it, it's typically 20% of the total data size. So your index is about two terabytes. 
Now, each file in our case, we recommend each file to be 250 MB. So you can take three terabytes divided by four, and if you want 250 millisecond response time, then you would allocate that many cores. And we typically suggest four cores per executor. So that's sort of is the math we do capacity planning. So the number of executors depend upon how many concurrent users you'll have, what's the size of the indexes that are ultimately created. So though, using those two parameters, we then help you estimate the capacity of the cluster. So these executors are not uh, continuously running, right? These are launched per query. Say that again? Sorry, I couldn't So the you. executors, they get launched when the user gives out a query. Is, is that correct? Or? No, the execute. so we have, we have a fixed analytics cluster, right? right. So it's not like a, uh, we don't, like Athena, for example, we don't spin nodes when the query comes in. I see. So you have a, it's like, it's like a Hadoop cluster, right? So, or a, or a, a persistent Spark cluster, or like EMR. So where you predefine, based on your analytics workload, how many users and what's the size of the data that you want to query on, then you would, you would allocate X amount of uh, executors and cores, but then you can add new nodes without bringing down the system, or reduce nodes without bringing down the system. I see. So you start with a fixed capacity, but then you can shrink it or grow it as you need it. So that means your executors are running all the time? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we, uh, just to follow up on that, the executors are running all the time because we need the locality information. That's another very important reason. Um, so you mentioned Athena. In Athena, there is a concept of a central catalog across the data lake, which is, I think, Glue. Is there a similar concept here, or how do you right. plan to do this on the Oracle Cloud? Yeah, so that's a good question. So right, I mean, right now we use a Hive Metastore of the client as our catalog, uh, but Oracle's coming up with a new catalog product, and you'll hear more about that in the future. So just a follow-up, means uh, Hive is okay with HDFS. You're saying is put Hive Metastore even if you have the data in S3? Um, in yeah, order so, to no, work we, with this product? So with this product, we, um, so you could create, so essentially we are running a Spark cluster. And Spark, Spark jobs use a Hive Metastore. So we use the Hive Metastore as just a place to capture our metadata. You don't need a Hive. So it doesn't, it's just, we, we, we run the Hive Metastore service. Now, if we have customers who use Derby, right? You don't need a Hive Metastore, but that's up to you depending on your workload and Okay, so there's no other questions. We'll go ahead and end the session. Thank you for coming. Thank you.